Good morning, family. Let's pray. God, speak that we might listen and respond. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture today is Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? So anyone who grew up um, in or has had proximity to the black church can at least at some point recall more than one preacher in the midst of a sermon making a proclamation and then saying, can I get a witness? And you'll hear a few amens or preach preacher or yeah, that's right. But it is this practice of proclaiming as a communal endeavor, this practice of um, affirming truth as a communal endeavor. It's affirmed by not just one, but many. Can I get a witness? Well, several years ago, I was sitting in the car um, as my husband was pumping gas, and um, I remember seeing an older man who happened to be white come out of the store. And he got into his very tall, um, extra long pickup truck. Well, for those of you who aren't from the South, like this isn't an odd occurrence in the South because many people are still farmers. And so the need for big trucks with extra long beds is not odd or strange to see, even in Durham, North Carolina, which is where we were at the time. And so he gets into his truck and not long after he gets in his truck, another car, a smaller car, pulls into the space beside him. And he sits there. Um, for a while before he begins to back his truck out um, of his parking space. But he turns his wheel too soon and he doesn't have enough room to clear the car parked beside him. He hits the car. And of course, once he hits the car, the woman driving the car, who happens to be black, gets out and is clearly frustrated. And she looks at him like, you know, dude, like, did you not see my car here? Did you not see me? you know, parked here. And I got, I expected the driver to get out of his truck and, you know, like apologize and say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, I didn't see you. But instead the driver gets out of the truck and he accused her of pulling into the space while he was backing out. And she says, no, I was already parked when you started to pull out and you hit my parked car. Now, y'all, I honestly believe that he was sitting so high up in his truck that he didn't see her pull into the space right after he got in his truck. But at any rate, they began to argue and you can begin to see this woman look around and gesture for those um, around who had seen this happen. Her actions, her face was pleading. Can I get a witness? Can somebody please step up and say that I'm not crazy here? Well, Dedrick, who has now finished pumping gas, gets back into the car. And I said, Bay, I don't want to leave yet because, you know, this man is acting like he didn't um, hit her car, like he's not responsible for hitting her car. And we witnessed this. But just as I said it, <clears throat> we saw a middle-aged black man who had also witnessed the accident approach the arguing parties. And Dedrick said, oh, I recognize him. He's a city official. And despite knowing you all, I have no question as to the credibility of my, um, of my character as a witness, but I knew 
um, that despite knowing my integrity, that a black man holding a city office would be considered a much more credible witness than me, who would be seen as a random black woman doing what I am expected to do, defend other black women. Last week, we interrogated our relationship to time and we looked at a new way of engaging the time continuum between the past, present, and future. Well, today is All Saints Sunday. It is the day within the Christian liturgical calendar that we remember and celebrate those who have come before. We honor our ancestors, forebearers, and saints. And so in this way, we continue in part this engagement across time. <clears throat> there are times though, times, in life when one factor changes the course of action or outcome. In conversation, such things are often indicated by the word since, since, um, S-I-N-C-E. We were going to the park, but since it rained, we decided to stay in. I didn't really want chicken, but since it was free, I ate it anyway. <laughs> I was going to stay as a witness, but since the city officials showed up, I was able to leave. Our passage begins, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, because we are surrounded by those who have come before, what we do or how we respond is or has changed. So I'm seeking to explore for the next few minutes how the contingency of not just a few, but a great many witnesses surrounding us can impact the actions we are being called to in this passage. Let us throw, that's an action, off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run another action with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing another action, our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher, the perfecter and pioneer of our faith. How do we keep going, keep hoping and working amid so many devastating realities without giving up, wearing out or falling apart? I know we keep coming back to messages like this, but you know, these are the times where repetition really becomes ritual because the things that we need to stay focused on, we can't stay focused unless we're constantly reminded to do that. But I wanna warn you, okay? I need to give a little precursor that I'll be leaning very heavily onto um, or into the analogies that appear in this passage today. But just hang in there with me, okay? I'm, I'm leaning into these analogies a little more than usual, but just hang in there, okay? So of these three actions, throw, run, fix, running with perseverance appears to be the main message here. It appears to be the goal. But how we preserve or endure, I believe, may be found in the cause to throw off and fix our eyes. Several years ago, when I decided I wanted to run a 5K, I received two pieces of advice. The first was not to run too fast, too far, in the beginning, right? To slow it down, to pace myself, and to gradually add more distance over time. Endurance training most often refers to cardio or aerobic exercise. It improves overall health, but it specifically um, strengthens the heart and the lungs and the circulatory systems. And all recommendations for beginning a new workout, particularly an endurance or cardio-based workout, um, include this kind of precursor from medical professionals and um, people who work with health and fitness that you need to listen to your body, to not ignore the messages or the needs of your body. This is a big deal in our analogy. If listening to what our bodies, minds, and emotion needs is part of running with endurance or having longevity, then this press isn't just about what we do for others. It isn't just what we do in the call of service to God, right? It isn't just about blind altruism, but it's about also um, being attentive to what we need when we need it, when we need to rest, when we need to slow down, when we need to take a break. 
that wrapped in this call to run far is a call to self-care. And it is often when we get tired, when we get exhausted, but fail to rest that injury happens. I don't think self-care is a new concept for us. I think the constant practice of self-care is a new concept for us. An injury, if we injure ourselves, may very well be the thing that keeps us from persevering in this run called life more than anything else. And so the second piece of advice I received from several uh, elder sisters was to not run at all until I had lost some weight. So you can imagine the stank face I got at that. You know, at first I was like, you know, how rude. Like, running is how I plan to lose weight, thank you very much. But because more than one person said it, and particularly they were people I respected and trusted, not saying they were right, I wasn't ready to admit that, right? <laughs> but that it was at least owed an interrogation. And so I leaned in with one of my spiritual mothers who was also a nurse practitioner and I asked her why. And she says, because it's too hard on your knees. And if you injure or wear out your knees, um, none of it will be worth it. She says, you also got to think about how your body's going to hold up over time as you get older. And I pushed back. I said, oh, but you know, someone told me to start um, slow and, and to not go too far. So it's not like I'm going to be pushing myself crazy hard. And she says, well, that sounds like good advice. But no matter how fast or how long you run right now, your weight will still cause stress on your joints. She says, you can actually walk as fast or nearly as fast as you run and the impact will be dec decreased while you work on dropping some of the weight. And I realized in sitting with this passage that there are some things we carry consistently, some weight that we must also release. That regular rest, which we need regardless, can contribute to healing, but that the rest alone cannot fully release the weight of pain, trauma, and struggle. More is needed. And perhaps that's why the call to run with endurance was preceded, right? Came before the call to throw. Some translations use the language lay aside. But the new international version is the one I like today because lay aside feels way too gentle for our times. Throw, to propel or to cast, especially to project by sudden motion, often by straightening the arm or the wrist. Now, some of us have witnessed the physical manifestation of a spiritual deliverance right? A release of things way too heavy to carry. This throwing away from oneself in worship, okay? This release and pressing out. Well, since we're talking about weight up in here, I used to watch the reality TV show <clears throat> called The Biggest Loser. And there was one episode where participants had to put back on all the pounds they had lost by strapping weights to their body and they had to run against each other in a competition. And whenever they hit a certain marker, um, the week that that marker represented in, in the competition thus far, they were able to take off the amount of weight that they had lost in that particular week. And I remember vividly watching them hit those markers and in desperation release the weight from their body and drop it to the ground. But by the time they got to the end, they weren't just dropping the weight. They were throwing the weight off. It was like they knew how much easier it would be to run once they no longer carried the weight. They knew how much easier it would be to win and to get to that finish line once the weight was gone. The dilemma for us is that the author of Hebrews makes it sound like it's oh so easy to just cast away the weight that burdens us. Like, can't you just get over your trauma? Can't you just stop that destructive coping mechanism? Of course, it's not that easy. If it were, we would do it. I don't know about you. If it were that easy, I would do it. I would just drop all this stuff away from me. I would just release it in a second's time. Even the Apostle Paul, who some attribute the authorship of this letter to the Hebrews to, confesses in his letter to the Romans. He says, what I want to do, 
I do not do. And what I hate, that's what I do. It just isn't that easy. But then we see another action. Fix. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the author or pioneer and finisher or perfecter of our faith. There is a difference between Jesus being the fixation of our attention versus Jesus lurking in the sidelines, lurking in the periphery of our vision. And we see this clearly in the passage where Peter joins Jesus in walking on water. Go back and read it sometime when you have a chance. And Peter takes his eyes off Jesus and looks at the wind he fixes his eyes on the thing that scares him the most, and he begins to sink. And, the, and Peter cries out, Lord, save me. And the passage says that immediately Jesus reaches out his hand to Peter. And then Jesus says to him, you of little faith, not no faith, but little faith. And this makes me wonder, is there a correlation being drawn between being focused on Jesus, fixed on Jesus and the longevity of our faith. Well, there is a form of meditation called Tritaka, and it is a meditative practice that is centered around fixing your gaze on one location or object. Most often it is um, the flame of a candle. And the practice is designed to increase intuition and foresight, openness and imagination. The belief of those who practice um, Tritaka is that by channeling our, our thoughts and, our, and focusing our minds, we can regain wasted energy and move forward in peace. But unlike many meditations done with our eyes um, closed, Tritaka is done with your eyes open. It is done um, while being aware and seeing. So to fix our eyes requires that our eyes be open, aware, seeing. We must focus on being aware and seeing Jesus. But y'all, this also isn't unique for us. We may struggle many times to stay focused on Jesus, but generally we know that keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus is important. That's not a, a, a new concept for us. So let's just say we do that. Right. Let's bypass that all together. Let's say, no, nope, we got our eyes fixed on Jesus. We stay fixed on Jesus. What is it about Jesus that we need to see? Are we seeing all that we need to see that can help us endure? Are we seeing Jesus in a way that will help us throw off this weight? And here's where I saw something that I hadn't noticed before in all the times I've read this passage. The author says Jesus endured the cross, but scorned its shame. And that thing hit me anew. It was, I was like, whoa, how did I miss like the, the weightiness, the heaviness of this? Jesus scorns, disregards, despises, actively rejects the shame that death on the cross was intended to bring by those in power who sentenced him to death. Jesus has contempt for the intended shame that the sins of others sought to bring to him. Contempt means Jesus treated the intended shame as beneath consideration and worthless. This is mind blowing to me because Jesus responded to the shame that came knocking in a way that shame actually makes us feel when it manages to bury itself in our soul which is our will, our emotions, and mind. Jesus, in essence, shames shame. A dear childhood friend of mine courageously returned to her home church to preach after years of being away. And in her sermon, she shared the traumatic story of marrying a person who not only abused her, but one night left her on the side of the road, um, badly beaten and near death. And she says, it's good to be home, but for years I didn't come back because I was ashamed. Shame doesn't just make us feel worthless and despised at our core, but many express this experience of feeling like everyone you pass, even strangers, can see your deepest, darkest secret. 
that they harbor contempt for you because of it. It is a steady feeling of loathing. Jesus bore the sin of all of us on the cross, but did not confuse our sin as his identity. Jesus did not own it. How do we know? We know because it doesn't ultimately keep him from right relationship with God, our father and mother, because the account says he scorned its shame and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus goes home. This is how we know that Jesus bore our sin, but didn't own it. It did not sever or create long term distance within the triune nature of God of which Jesus is part. Despite feeling, and some would actually say being forsaken by God, our father and mother on the cross, Jesus maintains his identity and returns home. There are certainly things in our life that we must repent of, things that we do that we must cast off. But here, there is also this implication that the sin that entangles may not be our own sin. That sin at its most basic is anything, you all hear me, anything that breaks relationship or keeps us from right relationship with God. Anything that separates us from God. This may be our own sin, but by Jesus' account, it may also be the sins of others. In either account, shame is the weight. And if we are not working to heal and release as we live and work, then it can cause more injury. It will break our hearts and stop us dead in our tracks. The author says to consider Jesus who endured opposition from sinners and others so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Y'all hear the analogy here. Endurance training, cardio training protects and strengthens the heart and the lungs. It keeps us breathing. Enduring means keeping our focus on Jesus who in scorning shame was proclaiming, I am priceless amid an act of dehumanization. Jesus was proclaiming, I am brave amid an act of terror. Proclaiming, I am here amid an act of annihilation. Proclaiming, I am loved amid an act of hate. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus who models for us what it looks like to actively reject shame. Healing from sin, and particularly the effects of sin of others that are unjustly forced upon us, is not optional in survival, but essential to survival. But further, it is essential to our call and service to God. That saying yes to God is to say yes to the rest, is to say yes to rest and self-care. It is to say yes to doing the work of healing continuously. It's not optional. But there's another hurdle worth mentioning. Casting off shame does take time, but the initial step is exposure. Another friend of mine described the most excruciating moment in her process of healing from shame as the moment just before she had to look at the origin of her shame. That was um, a do or die moment because she had this fear that, would, um, that she would not be able to survive the exposure of her shame. This most excruciating moment was the anticipation of something she would in just a moment after discover was a lie. She felt like she would not survive the exposure and would in her mind prove that she was bad, prove that everyone saw her as worthless, prove that she was alone. But in exposing it to a therapist she felt safe with and trusted, the moment she anticipated as her last began um, 
um, ended up being the first of a new path of life. One of the most humiliating, you all, exams I have ever had was on the day I discovered I was miscarrying during my first pregnancy. And I began in a split second to question what I had done. How had I caused this? What was wrong with me? You know, does this mean I shouldn't be a mother? Is this the judgment of God on me? And the doctor who examined me saw us, saw Dedrick and I in tears. I mean, we were barely holding it together, if that. He says, I know this is hard, but I want you to know that my wife and I also experienced this, that it is more common than you know. And perhaps he said we should talk about it more, but that this does not um, mark the end. And just that small proclamation, two little words that we've heard more often you, um, recently than usual, two little words, me too, from a doctor. I had never seen before. I mean, I'd never seen this man before. And to my knowledge, I haven't seen him a day since. But that these two words from him, me too, started my process of releasing shame. Then a spiritual director of mine said to me, me too. And a pastor that I was serving with at the time said to me, me too. And every time shame cracked a little more. The power of the Me Too movement that Tarana Burke started well over a decade ago is the same power we see here. Two small words, Me Too, created a crack in the exterior wall of shame. Me Too says it wasn't just me. It, you know, it isn't just me. The passage begins with since because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses because we are in the shadow of safety provided by those who come before and stand as credible witnesses since because we are surrounded by those who bear witness that they too were abused, dehumanized, and terrorized. They too faced down shame and made their way home. They too were scared and weary. They don't just stand with you, but they surround you. They become safety in the moment where exposure makes you feel that all will come apart if you name it, if you say it, if you look at it. They surround you and proclaim that your hurt is worthy of justice. They surround us all and proclaim that we are precious. Perhaps God is inviting us to throw off this weight, not in the presence of the world that hates. They can be, they can just be baffled by the outcome later on. You know, they can see the effects of what we do um, in private, right? They can be baffled by our hope and baffled by our freedom and baffled by our endurance. But what if God's invitation or what if God is inviting us to throw off the weight of shame before the cloud of ancestors who witness, proclaim that we are loved? That God is saying, no, you do this kind of intimate, hard work in the safety of those you love and trust. A cloud that in many African cultures includes Jesus. And Jesus is unquestionably a credible witness. The author says that when you forget, remember that Jesus endured what you are enduring. Jesus isn't giving advice as a spectator but, but um, only, but bears witness as one who knows firsthand because he lived it. We heal amid those we trust and love and we heal among those that we trust to love us that we can continue to resist and hold accountable those who terrorize us whether they live in our homes or are on our jobs or are leaders in systemic oppression can i get a witness wait for it wait for it can you hear it 
I can hear Jesus say, amen. And so we prepare to come to the, the table of our Savior today, proclaiming boldly that if we are to have contempt and scorn for anything in our life, then we should have it for shame. Receive with newfound gratitude the gift of grace that frees us from the clutches of death, that seeks to not only take our bodies, but our souls. We stand as those convinced that Jesus has more than proved himself to be credible, and we accept Jesus' invitation in the face of the evil this world uh, in this world to always come back home to ourselves back home to our true identity as those who are beloved back home to god god's love is not bound by time nor is it bound by space we don't have um, to be in a particular building um, with particular elements to receive the healing grace of god's table God's table is open. All are welcome who desire to draw closer to God. God's table is abundant. The grace given here is always, always sufficient and never runs out. And God's table is good. What we receive here is good for us. If we are what we eat, then at the table, we become God's love and grace. We become life. So let us begin our prayer by offering God the things that hinder and entangle. So whether you want to fix your eyes on one place in your home or even close your eyes, that's fine. Um, but I want us to take a moment and use images. Images are fine. We don't always have to use words. Um, don't worry about it being messy or confusion or, you know, whether or not you're getting this right. Right. Just let it be what it is and I want you to hold all the things that are so weighty for you the hurts the pains the worries but also throw in there the joy <laughs> and the things that you celebrate and I want you to just take a moment and I want you to imagine and see the light of God engulfing those things see the light of God take those things into God's self even if you feel like you know, they may return to you later. Let God hold them long enough for you to have room to receive the measure of grace that God wants to give you in this moment through the table. So just take a moment, take a moment and see the light of God engulf you and all that you hold fully in this moment. This is our prayer, trusting the God that we love, the most credible of witnesses. God, take all of us where we are. Cover our sins and the sins of others that we carry. Make room in us to receive your light, your love, your hope, your grace. Give us what we need to make the various elements we have gathered your body and your blood. Infusing in this sacred ritual your grace, binding us to those who have come before, who surround us and bear witness but also to those in the present day who stand with us and bear witness that Jesus saves. Help us to be fully who we are, who you have called us to. Help us to always, almighty God, come home. In Jesus' name, amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered the disciples together and um, they were eating the Passover meal. And scripture tells us that he took the bread and he blessed it. He broke it. He passed it around. And he says, take, eat. This is my body given for you. So take whatever element you have as the body of Christ and eat it. And then it says that he did the same with the cup. He blessed it and he passed it around and he says, drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant shared for the remission of your sins. Drink and be forgiven. And he 
says, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Remember my love. Remember my sacrifice. Remember what I modeled for you. Remember what I have promised. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And it says that they sung a hymn, greeted one another, and went out into the Mount of Olives. So if you're watching this in real time, I want you to greet one another, send love to one another, um, bear witness to one another in the chat. But if you're watching this at another time, take a moment and text someone or give someone a call. Be a witness. Be a witness to God's goodness. May you receive all the grace that God has for you. And may it come to you in the way that you need it most. Until later, may the peace of God be with you until we meet again.